Hello everybody, my name is Gerald Farka, professor for game studies and narrative design, and today we'll be about the question of how we, as humans, became post-human. To begin with, let us briefly take a look at the contents of today's session, which will be divided into two parts and videos, each of which ending in some study questions. Part 1, then, deals with the issue of the self and the post-human, with the game Fallout 4 and why we are so afraid of otherness, with the terrors and pleasures of the post-human, and also with the film Robocop and the issue of embodiment. In part 2, and a second video, we will go into further detail concerning post-humanity then, and address issues such as the four characteristics of the post-human, which are 1. Informational pattern over material instantiation, 2. Consciousness as an epiphenomenon, 3. The body as original processes, and 4. Human beings seamlessly articulated with intelligent machines. We will conclude then by discussing the movement from the liberal humanist subject to our post-human condition. As you can see, there is much to talk about, so let's begin. To approach the issue of post-humanism, it makes sense to start with the first hypothesis and regard Catherine Hale's distinction of the liberal self and the post-human. This movement, from a grounded self we regard as I, towards collective forms of being and the post-human, will follow us in its various incarnations throughout this talk. Hales then argues, when the self is envisioned as grounded in presence, identified with originary guarantees and theological trajectories associated with solid foundations and logical coherence, the post-human is likely to be seen as anti-human, because it envisions the conscious mind as a small subsystem running its program of self-construction and self-assurance while remaining ignorant of the actual dynamics of complex systems. The post-human, and also our fear of it, is addressed in many fictions, one of which is Bethesda Game Studios' Fallout 4. Fallout takes place in the Boston metropolitan area and surrounding Massachusetts, referred to as the Commonwealth. The game world is densely populated, and vibrant colors and weather phenomena, such as radiation storms or deep mist, display the Commonwealth as a destroyed yet picturesque environment where a fresh start seems imaginable. This regenerative appeal was never realized in the previous games and transforms Fallout 4 not simply into a warning of nuclear disaster, but also into an experience that suggests ways to cope with it and move forward in different directions. The game is set in 2287 and involves players in the role of the sole survivor who embarks on a mission to search for his lost son. Players may choose a female or male character, mother or father, but a focus soon shifts from the private sphere of the family to a societal struggle for utopia. On their journey through the Commonwealth, players encounter memorable locations such as Diamond City, where people have found refuge from the surrounding dystopia, Abernathy Farm, a small peaceful agricultural society, and Good Neighbor, a community of ghouls and criminals exiled from Diamond City. All of these seek help in different ways, and players may choose to intervene. In Diamond City, for example, a strange paranoia infests people's mind, who believe they are being swapped by identical-looking sins, artificial beings that are created by the Omnis Institute. This thematic links Fallout 4 to American science fiction films, such as Don Siegel's Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and foregrounds the game's satirical tone in conveying Cold War anxieties, particularly the fear of a hidden communist invasion. But this fear of otherness also refers to a thematic far greater than the struggle between the West and communism. The synth issue and fear of the Institute are widespread in the Commonwealth and several factions have their own idea of how to deal with the supposed threat and chart ways into the future. Whereas the Nationalist Brotherhood of Steel regard them as dangerous, as things that do not deserve to live, the railroad function as the humanitarian opposite. In their attempt to save the sins and hide them in safe houses until they are integrated into society, 
A clear connection to the real world underground railroad from the mid 19th century can be established, who helped African American slaves to escape to the north. The Institute, on the other hand, pursue a different agenda. They are the underground boogeymen of the Commonwealth and aim to replace the anarchical field from above with artificial beings so that they can establish a society of scientists. For this purpose, they create synthetic life forms in their laboratories and send them to the surface to cause confusion and, more importantly, set people in a constant state of paranoia of being replaced by intelligent machines. While playing Fallout 4 then, the following question may arise. Why are we as humans so afraid of intrusions from the outside? What might be called the fear of otherness? In this sense, Catherine Hale argues that the posthuman arouses both terror and the inner fear of being replaced as the dominant species. Post, with its dual connotation of superseding the human and coming after it, hints that the days of the human may be numbered. Humans displaced as the dominant form of life by intelligent machines. In addition, we feel a sense of body horror, the fear to lose a version of ourselves we deem as normal. A human subject dismantled and demolished, a human body whose integrity is violated, a human identity whose boundaries are breached from all sides. This is illustrated well by Paul Verhoeven's film Robocop. Here, policeman Alex Murphy, after being shot to death, undergoes surgery and is turned into a machine. In addition to this, the film tackles topics such as media influence, gentrification, corruption, authoritarianism, greed, privatization, capitalism, identity, dystopia, surrealism, consumerism and, of course, human nature. Alex Murphy, then, is a perfect example of body horror. In this picture, you can discern Murphy's body horror up close, when his former face is turned into a mask that covers the machine life form. In Robocop, then, but also in many other fictions, cybernetics destabilize the ontological foundations of what counts as human. And it is this embodiment which is at stake in the post-human condition. As Hales remarks, the body is a net result of thousands of years of sedimented evolutionary history. And it is naive to think that this history does not affect human behaviors at every level of thought and action. The body itself is a congealed metaphor, a physical structure whose constraints and possibilities have been formed by evolutionary history that intelligent machines do not share. She thereby contradicts the belief that we may one time erase a body, continue to live as informational patterns and become entirely different life forms. For there is a limit to how seamlessly humans can be articulated with intelligent machines, which remain distinctively different from humans in the embodiment. However, the posthuman is not only depicted as evoking terror, but it also evokes the hope of overcoming linear worldviews and rusty images of what it means to be human. This is so, for example, with the Major, the protagonist in Shirov's Ghost in the Shell. The Major is a synthetic full-body processes, augmented cybernetic human, employed as the field commander of Public Security Section 9. This means that the posthuman evokes the exhilarating prospect of getting out of some old boxes and opening up new ways of thinking about what being human means. Due to human augmentation technology available in the fictional world of Ghost in the Shell, the Major is able to access vast portions of the cyberspace and use it to her benefits. Her abilities include Neurobiology, cybernetics and computer technologies have advanced to such a point that most people possess neuro-cyberbrains, a technologically organic synthetic wetware computer used interface implant located in the suboptical nerve region of the cranium. This allows their minds to seamlessly interact with mobile devices, machines or networks around them. The neuro-cyberbrain revolutionized education and has made training in any task simply a matter of uploading the proper data. 
as you know it also from the film Matrix. So let us come to a preliminary conclusion and some study questions before going any further into the topic. We need first to understand that the human form, including human desire and all its external representations, may be changing radically and thus must be revisioned. We need to understand that 500 years of humanism may be coming to an end as humanism transforms itself into something that we must helplessly call post-humanism. Before coming to part two then, let us stick with some study questions first. So, what fiction do you know that deals with the issue of post-humanism? Do they portray human augmentation as body horror or as pleasurable? And what do you think about it? Do you think we need a body to exist, to determine who we are? Do we need a centered self to be alive? Thank you so much for your attention and be sure to be back for part two. These are the references I used for the talk and also the figure sources.